the fourth international conference on positive aging, hosted by the Institute for Social Innovation at Fielding Graduate University, was held recently in Los Angeles at the California Endowment Center for Nonprofit Management. The goal of the conference planners was to explore the ways in which the themes of wellness, community, life transitions, and creativity contribute to positive aging, which involves taking control of one's life being active in the community, engaging with others, building close relationships, and seeking meaning and purpose. Community plenary speaker George Vallant is professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and the Department of Psychiatry, Brigham and Women's Hospital. He's spent his research career charting adult development and the recovery process of schizophrenia, heroin addiction, alcoholism, and personality disorder. Connie Goldman, longtime host of National Public Radio's All Things Considered, introduced Professor Vallant to the conference. I can tell you something a little personal. And for those of you who don't know the work of George Vallant uh, in his, uh, well, all of his work in the recovery process of schizophrenia and heroin addiction, alcoholism, and personal personality development, which was part of his early career, before he jumped into uh, the aging world, uh, I want to tell you that uh, I have an update on his uh, retirement from Harvard Medical School. He has left Boston. I bet some of you didn't know this. He now lives just recently in Southern California, <laughs> in Orange County. Welcome. And what I also want to tell you, because I always find these things out because I'm in a late life relationship, uh, he uh, is fairly newly married. And uh, so if I do a second edition of late life, love, romance, and new relationship in the later years, one of my books, he's the first person I'm going to interview. <laughs> I think you've heard enough from me, <laughs> and I'm going to turn the microphone over to our distinguished speaker, George Valiant. Uh, it's an enormous treat to be here, and my um, usual advice to anybody anticipating growing old is when you come to a minefield and you see footsteps, follow them. <laughs> and I used to use that as a preface for don't listen to people like Beauvoir and Shakespeare and Alex Comfort because they're all under 60 and what do they know about growing old? And I, my advice was find someone who's 85 or older and pay close attention to how they live their life and you don't need to read any self-help books. But I made a wonderful discovery when I, just before I came into this room, uh, someone was talking about the very old. And I said, well, how old is that? And he said, well, you know, when their hands start to shake, I'd say about 75. Well, I'm 76, and I now can join the very old, so you're going to have to listen to me. <laughs> uh, aging. Aging means different things. Aging means decay. It's perfectly true. As we get older, our hearing gets worse, our eyesight gets worse, our knees don't run as fast, Jeter isn't going to be a very good shortstop by uh, 2012. Derek Jeter is a shortstop for the Yankees. He may not carry much weight out here. And uh, <laughs> so aging is a really bad thing. Uh, or aging is simply the progress of life. May turns into December, which turns back into May. At Age 17 and age 70 are really very similar. When they go to the beach, 
they both rush to pick up sweethearts. The only difference is the 17-year-old picks up 17-year-olds and the 70-year-old picks up 7-year-olds. Or there's a third type of aging. And that aging, for those of you that have wine cellars, is going on right now. This is aging in the sense of development. And this is aging in the sense that the brain was programmed to mature. There's a reason for grandparents in an evolutionary sense. Uh, the Cro-Magnons had them. The Neanderthals died at about 40 and only had parents. And in an evolutionary sense, Cro-Magnon won by a whole species step. So I've been asked, at least in the title, that I was going to talk about positive aging and community. But what that assignment didn't pay attention to is the fact that I'm a psychoanalyst and more than one person at a time makes analysts nervous. <laughs> so, in, so instead of uh, telling you what you who are all working in the aging field and are interested in what the community can do for the very old, uh, I'm going to talk about what the very old can do for the community, in other words. And because I've had the experience in the last few months of having the PowerPoint break down and forcing you to imagine in your mind's eye and in your limbic system what I was talking about, uh, I have no PowerPoints. And the moral of this is it's very important that we get out of our cortex and into our limbic system. And that doesn't matter whether you're five or you're a hundred. And five-year-olds are pretty good at it. And with the passage of time, education and the printing press uh, moves us up into our cortex. And that isn't where the fun lives. And it isn't, um, well, we should just understand that the positive emotions, not the ones that positive psychology pushes, which are really kind of dumb and talk about happiness and are all about me, but the emotions that have to do with other people, like trust, hope, forgiveness, gratitude, joy, and love. And so that the bottom line, and this is more important as we get old, is I don't want you to think less of yourself. I want you to think of yourself less. And if you haven't learned that by the time you're my age, you're in for a lot of trouble. Because it doesn't do much good to think about me as you get older. And yet, Carol Gilligan points out that for people that are like all of you around 30 or 35, <laughs> it's fine to be selfish. Because if you aren't selfish when young, you won't have a self to give away when you're old. So again, the bottom line is to keep it, you have to give it away. But those of you that are 50 and generative and self-satisfied at this young me generation that's coming along, be tolerant of them. Be empathic. They're just trying to learn the things so that they can become you. Now, the whole idea of adult development is a very new one. The first man to write a book on uh, old age, a man named, um, I can't ever pronounce it, but his name, last name was Nasher. And he had enormous trouble getting his book published in 1914. Life moved on. And by 1926, thanks to the Carnegie Foundation, Stanford 
set up the first academic program on aging. And to make sure that it had powerful effect, the Carnegie Foundation endowed it with a total of $10,000. Okay. Then in the 30s, Berkeley started its famous prospective developmental study of uh, newborns. And by 1940, that became the Nidus or Erickson's first research where he could follow prospectively infants into latency age. And then he wrote Childhood Society. Everything in it after 15 is basically written from an armchair. But at least he was inspired with development. Now, adult development also began at Berkeley at the same time with uh, Charlotte Bueller and Frankel Brunswick. And they decided the only way to do it was to study autobiographies. Now, autobiographies, unfortunately, are retrospective. But they, in the late 30s, uh, wrote books on adult development. And they, not paying attention to their data, but the way, at that point, people were trained to think about aging, drew the usual stairs up until 50 and then downward into the grave model of adult development. And this, of course, is the one that Shakespeare and then the Pennsylvania Dutch drawings of <coughs> adulthood have made just ingrained it in, 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 into our minds. But the nice thing about uh, Bueller and Frank Brunswick's research is that what they found had nothing to do with what they thought. And a basic rule of cognitive therapy is don't believe everything you think. <laughs> but paying attention to the little prince in St. Zupere, uh, listen to the heart. It sees a lot better than the eyes. So paying attention to your feelings has worked pretty well. Anyway. <coughs> they asked 25-year-olds uh, uh, what their wishes were. And 92% of 25-year-olds' wishes <coughs> were directed towards Ma, directed um, towards themselves. They asked 65-year-olds the same <coughs> question. And they, um, in one-third towards the self, one-third towards their family, and one-third towards the community. And Erickson, working from an armchair, which is a lot better than I've done with real data, uh, described adult development as a widening social radius. Now, he being an MCP, drew it as an upward ladder every decade. We have a wider radius and are more clever and wiser and deserving of attention. And Carol Gilligan pointed out to me that I was thinking that way. And what if you dropped a stone in the water? And so adult development was expanding concentric circles, again with the widening social radius. Now, I'm going to leave uh, identity, intimacy, and career consolidation uh, alone for reasons of time. And I want to talk about generativity, which is learning to care for people other than yourself. All the negative emotions and all the cognitive positive psychology emotions are directed towards me. You go into a bookstore and you head straight for the uh, cell 